What's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. We are going to be talking about genome engineering today. We have a very special guest, Andrew Hessel. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for the invite. Really appreciate it. We're super excited to learn about humane genomics, learn about genome engineering in general, learn about synthetic virus engineering. And you even brought oh, a 3D printed virus. Bum, bum, bum. It's my pet virus. <laughs> it's my pet virus. It was made by a good friend, Aaron Berliner, during my time at Autodesk. And it's uh, probably one of the only real 3D printed viruses in the world. Uh, probably the biggest, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you're challenging us. Can we 3D print a bigger virus? Uh, I kept getting stopped at airports with this one, so I highly don't, I really oh, recommend not traveling with, yeah, with large, a pet virus. large pet viruses. So yeah. where's its source of nutrition and of energy? <laughs> what is the funny thing is people know so little about viruses. They, uh, they often ask, is it real? Like, is it a real virus? It's like, no, clearly not. Yeah. Can it hurt me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because I, if I threw it's it heavy. at you, this would hurt. It's heavy. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, just a quick uh, little enter into virus life. Yeah. There are so many different shapes and sizes. Evolution has viruses are as old as bacteria, billions of years old. Yeah, they've co-evolved with us. Co-evolved with, with all us. life on the planet. With yeah. all life on the planet, and therefore, is this circular-shaped virus a specific? one that you have? Is your pet a specific? Uh, this, is, this is a particular virus uh, called uh, Phi X174, which has got quite a long history in genomics because the genome of Phi X174 was the first DNA genome ever sequenced, um, and it was the second genome ever synthesized. Hmm. So it, it's just one of my favorite viruses, and there's people that have devoted their lives to working with, uh, working with this virus and understanding its biology. It, it's safe for humans. It only infects bacteria. Oh, um, cool. So it's a, a model virus, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's really contributed to our basic understanding of genomics. Awesome. And that's why we have our pet virus. I like having it in the center of the table. Normally we have the plant. <laughs> Sometimes people bring, I'm so glad you brought a physical, tangible item to showcase. Uh, I'm happy you brought your pet. Everything else I work with is invisible. It's ideas, yes. it's you know, DNA, molecular systems. Yeah. I think more scientists having a tangible item, even if their work is usually in code or in DNA and biology, it's still so good to have something tangible. Okay, your background um, covering everything uh, from doing work in helping out with breast cancer, that's huge, helping figure out how to solve breast cancer, um, helping out, and that, and that organization was called the breast, sorry, the pink Army Cooperative. Army Cooperative. Yep. And then you were the founding director there. Then a bunch of research at Autodesk. Mm -hmm. And that was seven years or so of that? Uh, I, about six and a half years. Six yeah. and a half years. And then at Singularity University, bioinformatics and biotech co-chair. Yep. And then that's 10 years or so. And now humane genomics, a year and a half. Yeah, and lots of other. I, I actually was, you know, my background is cell biology and genetics. That was my, my focus when I was in school. And then I, uh, I aborted my PhD program and I went straight to the biggest biotech in the world at the time and, and kind of learned on the job during a very exciting time when uh, the human genome race was underway between kind of the public groups and the private groups. Um, it was a fascinating time. So I, I've, I've, I just have never really left school. I'm always learning. I'm always prototyping. I'm always on the you know, exploring the forward edge, and it's a privilege to do it. Um, yeah. I, I, I open doors. I, I, I shine lights into dark little places where people may be afraid to go. Yes. And I try and prototype things by doing them so I have some real world experience. But I, I, you know, particularly in the world of cancer, I just want to make the point that I'm not going to be the one who cures cancer. There will be a lot of people that kind of 
do that, but it is such a major area of R&D because we need to explore the systems that produce cancer and the various molecules and, and s tools that we have to kind of defeat it. But, um, uh, you know, but it, is, it supports a very large community globally. But I, I like to be on the forefront of the things that I think are actually going to make a big difference. Yes. Um, and, and viruses are, are a part of that. And that's why you're with us today. P, we love people at the edge and that are, like you said, shining light <laughs> I, I, into I darkness. I tell everyone I live five years into the future. Most yeah. of the stuff that I'll share, you know, has been bubbling away for a long time and it'll probably still take a few more years for it to really emerge. But, but that's the place I'm happy to be. I can't change the past. The present yeah. is so fleeting. I tend to be future oriented because we all get to build it. Yes, yes. And that's, again, another one of the reasons why we love you. We love so many people that come on the show. We love identifying people that are looking forward three years, five years, and trying to work on those projects to be at the edge. Um, it's so interesting when you move to go visit other places in the world. Sometimes there is a rare time that there's places that are more technologically advanced than the Bay Area is. So it's very cool to be able to be here. Sometimes it definitely feels like... It's, it can be a little overwhelming sometimes about how future everything is here. You, you do have to, you know, rewind some, reset and recalibrate some time. Because, yeah, we do, we're always building the future here in the Bay Area. Go even to New York and you get a completely different flavor and perspective on, on yeah. technologies and how quickly they're disseminating. Yes. Let alone, you know, the middle of the country. Yeah, yeah. So we have a, a bunch of cool slides that are gonna walk us through a lot of the work and we'll be able to kind of stop and talk about them as we go. Um, our friends over at NeoLife made this. Yeah, it was part of a feature they did on, on some of the, the Genome Project Right, which we'll cover in a bit. I just like this animation. because It's usually, such a good one. Uh, you know, you, when you go and give talks, they always do some intro and they're reading a blurb that you know, they probably pulled off the web that's outdated. I usually always give a little intro into just who I am. We've covered most of it, but, but uh, I, I wanna I tell people like don't follow my path in science I'm not a traditional scientist I'm 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 essentially a sophisticated hacker um, uh, there's lots of different people that hack biology today but but I like to think that I was kind of one of the first professional grade ones that took the knowledge of the biotech industry and started to apply it in new ways yep yep and biohacking is now, has now created not only so many interesting opportunities in the biotechnology space, but also now people are doing so many other hacks into n neuroscience, like neurohacking. Um, people are hacking into like understanding better the cryptocurrency functioning and blockchain functioning mm -hmm. and the hacking with that cyber AI hack, this robot hack. There's so many, the, 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 I, I sometimes feel like I live in a simulation with all of the, <laughs> with all of this. <laughs> I, you know, on. if you want to go on the, down that, you know, rabbit hole, I'm happy to go there. We could. We may <laughs> at the end. At the end, we'll get there. We'll get there together. Anyway, I love this. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so tell us what's going on here. Here, here the, I, I, you know, when I give my talks, I realize most people just have no understanding of biology. So I just take, I say, look, you, let, let's just take it down to basics. Every living thing on the planet is made of cells. Uh, every living thing. Plant. But the chair is not. Well, it's not a living thing. Yes. So it's not made of cells. Yes. But every living thing on the planet is. So on the left here is bacteria. That's E. coli bacteria, time lapse, they're growing and dividing. And on the right, it's a, it's a human cell in, in a culture. But they're essentially variations on the theme. The thing that I love about this is you can tell in these time lapses, there's a lot of stuff happening in mm -hmm. these cells. They're actually manufacturing thousands of different proteins. They're, they're regulating their metabolism, they're getting in energy, they're getting in nutrients. Your, your screen just froze. But it doesn't, the interesting thing is that with, you know, I, I call these cells essentially the most sophisticated 3D printers in the world. They're yes. multi-material, yes. they, use, they use elemental starting points, essentially carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. and they're kind of the ultimate 3D printer in that they make more 3D printers. Yes. That's it. They're fully programmable though, which is, you know, kind of the, where I lead into the next slide. For me, I look at any living organism on the planet being a cell biologist and it's like, yep, strip it down to the cells and then I go deeper into the genome and, and I just start looking at the code. Okay, and right before we get to the code, because this is, this is mind blowing. Mm -hmm. 
cell division is this is the way that life started on Earth. Yeah. And okay, everything that's living is made of cells, and the this is E. coli versus human cells. So there's a difference in terms of the. Uh, not only the genetic code of these the complexity, two things, the complexity of yeah. them. Um, uh, e. coli can be maybe expressed in a certain amount of ways, and a human cell might be expressed in more ways. Well, no, just take a look at what's happening here. This this organism, E. coli, has a genome that's about 4.5 million bits of code, million. So that's about the same amount of data as uh, is in a photo on a, on your phone. Um, that's enough to run this organism. It has f about 4,500 genes. It's, it's yeah, fairly yeah. complex, and, and yeah. it's been around for billions of years. It, it knows what it's doing. You know, you look at this cell, and it's clearly more sophisticated. It's got some motion. Um, it, you can see that the edges of the of, of the cell are kind of exploring and sensing its environment. The chromosomes. Are, are much more sophisticated. In fact, you can see some divisions in these cells if you, if you watch long enough um, as they grow and divide. There's six billion bits of code in a, mm -hmm. in a human cell. Mm -hmm. Much more sophisticated uh, genome, much larger. That's you know, comparable to a, to a movie uh, mm -hmm. and to a DVD. And, and yet they basically do the same things. They, they run metabolism, they organize the cell, they adjust to the environment, and ultimately they make more of themselves. And um, then the, their, their genetic code is expressed in certain ways depending on the functionality that it needs. Yeah. Like at the, if you strip this down to the basic cellular, here's a cell dividing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you strip it down to its basic cellular Crazy. machinery, it's actually very similar. It uses the standard genetic code. The chromosomes are a little more sophisticated in their organization. There's a lot more code. But even the machinery inside the cell that reads the code and interprets it and makes proteins, it, it's all based on a, on a, a similar template. So the, I like to say that you know, if you study genetics and cell biology, you really study every living thing. Mm -hmm. And there's only one programming language to learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> it's not like you have to learn a whole stack just to go and put up your, you know, your, your web page. Yeah, yeah. Well, the central dogma of biology is good to learn in order to understand this better, which I have such a long way to go to understand it. But this is fascinating. I'm really happy that you brought this with us. OK, now, in terms of the code, Okay, four. There's there's four nucleotides. Nucleotides. So, if you look at all the software that's ever been written for computers, essentially it reduces down to ones and zeros. Now we don't use ones and zeros, you know, in the in the programming, but that's essentially the idea. It's a it's a digital binary digital code, and and you know everything computing is based on that. Everything living, yeah, it's based with a with, with a four base code. Um, it's not one and zero, it's A, T, G, and C, but, but the code essentially is sufficient to create every living organism that exists today or has ever lived. So there's a tremendous amount of flexibility in the code just as ones and zeros have produced every bit of software. Um, so uh, this is the code I love to play with, and in fact, the, you know, most of my career has been spent at the intersection of the di of, of digital biology, of, of taking this code, you can see it's kind of just a bunch of A, T, G's, and C's in a computer file. It's in a computer file. So ultimately, it's A's, T's, G's, and C's that have now crossed over into the world of zeros and ones. Yeah. And that, that intersection uh, of, of the chemical DNA, the polymer, and, and the digital world um, of computers has, has really been my life. I started doing this, this work. I started working with computer software in the early 1980s. I started focusing on bioinformatics in, in the late 1980s. And, and now the, the intersection just gets more and more interesting. And in the six a billion bits that you were talking about earlier are the, in the human cell are the six billion letters. Yeah, yeah, because a bit is essentially a letter. Is a letter. Yeah, bioinformatics. It's been it's forty years now that's been growing and, and changing, and now uh, to be able to now we're going to talk more about reading 
yeah, well, these theses and G's and then being able to write them. Yeah, as what well. I tell people is that it's a language. Yeah. Like uh, it, you know, we we talk about we talk about DNA as being a blueprint. Uh, well, blueprints are a language too. It teaches people how to go and build something. Um, and this means everything from coding uh, like a, a cell of a heart this, all the way this to coding code will, the color of your eyes to coding something that is a genetic uh, d something that's causing suffering because it's a uh, harming you genetically like sure. the code the code makes the organism runs the organism handles all the repair of the organism handles the yep. duplication or, or or recombination of new organisms so it's it's really important if you change the code you change the organism yeah uh, and uh, that's to me is fascinating that's why yeah. you, as a cell biologist you look at the code and you realize hmm what would i like this cell to do today and, and mm -hmm. you know, you've got a language, a programming language, to go and do that. And we've, you know, we, we first determined the structure of DNA in, in 1953. We figured out the lexicon of DNA, kind of cracked the genetic code in and the late 1960s. Cr crick and Watson. Well, no, they didn't no. crack the code. The, okay. they, they cracked the structure. Sure. And by understanding the double helical structure, you can you realize it's like a zipper. You can unwind it, and they realize, oh well, that explains how you can make copies and duplicate. But but it wasn't the cracking of the code, understanding A's, T's, G's, and C's, and how that turns into proteins, you know, which are the structural and, yeah. and metabolic components of our cells. That took until the 1960s, and, you know, late 1960s. This this. This double helix that can that looks like mm -hmm. a, a zipper mm -hmm. that you can unzip in its sense that you were you were just explaining that 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 then taught us how it can make copies and yeah that itself. by understanding by understanding that it was actually a a double helical structure explained the mechanism of how uh, uh, of how genetic material was duplicated and passed to daughters organisms and cells so so. Of yeah, because if it was a single molecule, it would be hard to figure out. You know, how would it create a perfect copy? But now you could unwind, make two perfect copies, uh, and and distribute to to the cells. Is so, it fair so the to structure say that it could also be that 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 is the fifty percent, fifty percent from the two previous generations. It's a little more complex than that. You do get one. Um, you do get half your genetic material from mother and, and half from your father, but there's another process called meiosis that does a lot of shuffling mm -hmm. of this material. So it gets a little more complex. Cool. Let's not go there, but... Okay. but, but <laughs> yeah, no, no, you know, let's go there. I like no. that. Half from mom, half from dad. Mm -hmm. well, 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 you also bring your own genetic code, don't you? So isn't the, the name of the game to not turn into your mom and dad, but to become yourself? <laughs> <laughs> you... you, you Yes, that, that, and absolutely, that's, and that's the nurture aspect of it, right? Oh, that's different. That's, yeah, that's completely different. Because right? you, when you get popped into the environment, you have your nature, which is the fifty mom, fifty dad, and then the nurture is what do you do in the environment? Yeah, well, it's all your experience in the environment, and yeah, we tend to process that through human experience. But even a bacterium, you know, even uh, has its own experience in the environment. Yeah. So, so. Uh, you know, it, it's it's a. Uh, we're playing God now. Yeah, we're. we're this is we're, this is exciting stuff. But we but, are God. We Stop are with God. the playing God. We better we better uh, take really strong control uh, over our ethical conversations about this stuff. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's let's move on. This is this has been essentially the core of my life. It's it, yes. just working with DNA. I spent my early years working with groups that were doing reading of DNA. Today it's pretty sophisticated. Today we can read a human genome in, in hours. These, uh, this is a typical genome center. The machines are, are just robotic. They have a few people loading them and tending to them, but for the most part they just run 24-7, uh, churning out data. And this was not possible 50 or especially not 100 years ago, so this is... Oh, just, God, yeah. no, no. The first, the first really effective DNA sequencing um, you know, really was only developed in the late 1970s. Uh, the technology and it's the amazing. refinements that have, that have been made ever since um, are pretty remarkable. We're on generation eight now of different types of DNA sequencer technologies. But, but they're the just fully Illumina? robotic. 
Is that the Illumina is is the, one of the major ones? Yes, the is one of the major companies. And then these what are is Illumina this machines. High Seek, High Seek X is, is is an Illumina machine. It's cool. a, it's an Illumina machine that's cool. developed for high throughput clinical grade genomes. And there's a whole process which we can't unpack right now, but that it, when you when you enter in your your sample into the machine, it then goes through the process of actually breaking apart the double helix and sequencing it. Yeah, right. And without getting into the protocols, the, the important thing to understand is this is taking a chemical, the DNA molecule, and it's digitizing it. Yep. Yep. Like that's it. It's just all the machines yep. essentially do the that's same thing. Point. They read it and digitize it so it can go into a computer, which leads into the next slide, yep. which is comprehension. You've got all this data. What do you do with it? Well, you, the goal is to understand how the cell is operating. So this is essentially a map of cell metabolism. It's not a, it's not, wow. it's a high level graphic, but it's actually a visual that's produced dynamically from a database called KEGG. K-E-G-G. -G. Which and, stands for? Uh, I forget at the, okay. off the top of my head. I haven't used it in a long time. But, but this is the cell metabolism. This is here. a map of cell metabolism. Gosh, xenobiotics, bio uh, And there's all different classes, biosynthesis of other secondary metabolites, blah, blah, blah. Lipid uh, metabolism. I mean, this, how does one spend their whole life? I mean, on, you have to spend your whole well, life Well, this is the collective this. summary of, of the effort of tens of thousands of people, people. over Decades yeah. and decades. Standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so it's an amazing database, and, and which is remarkable. And then if you click again, mm -hmm. I, I kind of zoom in just on, a, on, a, uh, on, a, on just a part of the pathway, glycolysis, which you know you've taken bio 101. But glycolysis being? Essentially the, the breaking down of sugars into ener energetic. Which molecules. is what powers the cell. Yeah, and it's one of the pathways. So, so but every single box that you see here has a numerical code, 5.3.1.1 for this one example. Those are enzymes. Those are enzymes that catalyze the reaction, in this case, you know, from, from this molecule to this molecule. And, and there's various pathways. It's all branched. But just by mapping all of these enzymes, et cetera, you kind of build a roadmap of all biochemistry. And the cool thing is if you drill down to any of these enzymes, because we've sequenced genomes, we can actually get the code for that enzyme and clone it, for example. So, so all of cell metabolism is essentially mapped, and that's kind of the feedstock for being able to do designer genomes. Mm -hmm. um, because now you can literally program metabolism from the ground up. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. pretty cool. Because yeah. now if you say, ah, oh, man, I want, you know, phosphophenol pyruvate, you can basically build a metabolic pathway to go and make that mm -hmm, molecule. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the fun part. So, yeah. so by reading and analyzing all the genomes that we've collected, you know, for the last, since we started the genome project and developed this technology, uh, now we're getting to the point where we can start going, hmm, what do I want to make cells do? And now that's where your genome project, uh, on the writing side of things. Well, this is just where I started to get fascinated by DNA synthesis technology really almost 20 years ago. And, and so if you, can, if you can take the molecule of DNA and digitize it, well, you can do the reverse. You can take a digital yep. representation of DNA and turn it into the molecule. And now you're able to go and do digital biotech. So the reverse process of sequencing is called synthesis, where we essentially direct the synthesis of DNA. And, and this is the synthesis cycle. It's called phosphoramidite synthesis. It's a chemical process that was developed a long time ago, about 40 years ago, to go and synthesize the DNA molecule. How do you take ones and zeros in a digital form and put it into a... Well, you need a printer that can accept ones and zeros and can do this type of chemistry. And can print it into a cell? Well, it, it prints the DNA molecule, and then you the put DNA the DNA molecule into, into a cell. A cell. Yeah, so the ones and zeros get converted by the printer. What does a DNA printer look like? Uh, they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Um, these aren't things that you generally buy off the shelf. Um, they're getting better, uh, but there's no home DNA synthesizer yet. Yeah, yeah. In the future, there will be. Yeah. There, there'll be home DNA sequencers, too. Yeah. They're already getting to the point where the latest DNA sequencers are, are disposable chips that are, are in units small enough to attach to a cell phone and use in the field. Yeah. We will have that for synthesis. It's, we're just not there yet. 
today. The synthesizers, if you open them up, are, are pretty complex chemical synthesis robots. Uh, in the future, it'll all move to chips. Um, so, uh, but this is just writing of DNA is the big thing because now, you know, that's the foundation of the entire biotech industry. Uh, and now DNA writing has become a, a digital, highly accessible, pretty inexpensive technology. The stuff I can teach a, a student to do today um, using these digital, digital biology tools um, surpasses the capabilities of what a biopharma company could do 20 years ago. Damn. It, it's, it's only getting it, like that. The next 20 years will be just like that. It's well, and, and we're just getting going. Yeah, we're just getting going. Yeah. Oof, humanity. Got to get our think. Got to get our ethics and we got to get our stuff together as which well is, as we do this. Which is why, you know, which is why, which leads into the next slide, the, which is why... I'm really amazed uh, and delighted to be a co-founder of something called the Genome Project Right. Yeah. Oh, there's um, George Church. George Church. Yeah. George is everywhere. Yeah. And, yeah. No, George is an amazing genetic scientist. So is the guy, you know, the other guy in the photo. This is this is Jeff Buka, who is currently running uh, one of the largest genome projects in the world to make a synthetic yeast genome. Mm -hmm which is really remarkable. Yeast cells are single-celled organisms, but their genome organization is very similar to our own. They're, they're closer to you and me than they are to bacteria. Damn. And, and of course, yeast is, makes bread and beer, so mm -hmm. it, it's pretty remarkable. Yeah. But, but the organism itself is an amazing research platform. Um, and, and frankly, it, it constantly blows my mind. The fact that you can go to Safeway and buy it freeze-dried, add water, and boot it up is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, but but the, you know, the four of us got together, this Nancy Kelly, Jeff Buka, George Church. And what's Nancy? Nancy is, uh, uh, man, she's just a spark plug. She, she brings together diverse groups and organizations and gets them to work together. Awesome. Uh, Connector. She's, uh, her background is law. Um, but she's really good at putting together these groups and getting them to work together. So she's been instrumental in starting the New York Genome Project and another group in New York called the Alexandria Life Sciences Center. Uh, she's collectively helped start billion dollar organizations working in life science. Um, and we just happen to be all in the right place at the right time to, to suggest that maybe it was time for a new genome project. Um, it's really focused on the human because that's what people pay attention to. Um, and, and instead of being, you know, building on the foundation of the first human genome project, which was to read the human genome, um, yep. start thinking about, well, let's think about writing a human genome. Yes. And center of excellence for engineering biology. And it's really important to have leading figures that are talking about writing and the ethics of writing and all the other nuance that's coming along. I mean, there's so many this, things. This became standards. a platform to pull together genomic scientists around the world and people working in related fields, the humanities, law, etc., to think about how do we build a platform to go and engineer large genomes beyond just bacteria or yeast? Um, what's the technologies that are required? What's missing? What do we need to start putting our effort in? But also take a look at, well, what ethics do we need? What, what standards do we need? What, what's the intellectual property structure? How do we share? Yeah. How do we finance this? Because you can't necessarily just go and say, hey, I want to go and make synthetic genomes and expect any government to come along and plunk down money. How do we work together as a global community? Yes. And, and I, it's been a privilege being part of this and watching it grow. Today, there's hundreds of researchers uh, attached to the project, uh, I think a thousand people overall, and it's turned into a federation of different, uh, of different labs and institutions around the world. It's really remarkable. So it's only, you know, we're only less than three years in, so it's still getting going. But just with the rate of evolution of the technology, um, I expect that we'll have the first synthetic human genome made. And I want to be clear, we're not making synthetic babies. 
but just being able to synthesize a large genome like the human genome and getting it to work in cell culture is massive. Yeah. But I expect that we'll have the technology to do that within a decade. That's pretty remarkable. Yeah. Synthetic babies. Well, a lot of people ask me about synthetic babies and frankly, I don't have a problem. I have two engineered babies. They're the product of IVF. We just crossed the 40-year threshold of, of the of first IVF, IVF baby uh, last week, in July In vitro 25th. fertilization. And in vitro fertilization. What, what, what is the process for in vitro that, rather than inside? It's, it's basic cell biology, basically. You're, 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 How does it get its nutrients and its... Well, we didn't, you know, you only do the work to make the embryos in the lab. They're five days, they grow in a nutrient solution, and then you implant them into the mother. So, so you they grow like a normal baby. They, five, 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 day, five days is how long it takes for the embryo? They grow the embryos to five days to, to basically make sure that they're growing and dividing properly. And how many about cells is that? Does that become? Oh, it's a few hundred cells by that time. A few hundred cells. Yeah. And then you can just implant it into the... Yeah, it's a, like a five-minute procedure. And it just accepts the... the yeah, the, the uterus is a pretty amazing organ. Yeah. So he says he's not developing synthetic babies, but then yeah. he goes on and tells us how they're developing well, we've, synthetic we've been babies. making designer babies for 40 years. Um, now, we're not designing wow. their genomes, but we've, yeah. we've taken control of the reproductive process. It's 40 yeah. years. And, uh, now, what's a reason why we would do IVF? Well, there's a lot of people that just can't naturally conceive. So yes. by being able to take control over the process, move it into the lab. Well, maybe they shouldn't. <laughs> maybe that's why they can't naturally conceive. I'm just saying. The reason we are alive is not to make podcasts. Uh, it, it is to go and make babies. That's the reason that we're here. It is the fundamental biological drive. Survive and reproduce. And, and, it, and it seems as though the, although the procreation and the, the continuation of the genetic code is yes, the reason you know, why we're here. At the same time, it's starting to become more and more clear that we might not need so many people having offspring. The more countries that become developed, the lower the fertility rates become. Yeah. The more medics, cultural information transfer becomes a priority. Geopolitical leadership becomes a priority. These different types of conversations are now being had as well, which is very interesting. I'm, I'm not qualified to really comment on all that, but I just, you know, right well, you now. Have two IVF but but yourself. right. So yeah. I have two IVF babies, yeah. Uh, and, and the thing that I've learned about this, because I was really resistant to having children, I wasn't from a particularly. Um, family-friendly home. Uh, we are, my, by nature, I think our, my family tends to all scatter to the wind. Um, but that being said, uh, I am getting a PhD in, in, uh, in babies, and it is, you know, it is the hardest course I've ever taken, but also <laughs> the most satisfying. Like, yeah. uh, my babies teach me a ton, more than anything I ever learned in school. So, so that's very interesting. It it is a very educational process to to mold a mind into this. Well, that's just it. You you are creating bodies and minds, and uh, and you don't really have that much control. So it, it's very humbling. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have that much control over the organisms I work with in the lab either. But I think that you know I think that the whole idea of designer biology in some ways is is um, is pretty romantic yeah yeah designer biology <laughs> but, but i do take awesome. it to heart that if yeah. you start to work and design biological systems in any capacity you have a certain responsibility because you become the parent of that system yeah. and all you have to do now is just take the the um the ivf scenario and it, and and you le potentially leverage some of your technology with humane genomics to be able to edit as you please or any new CRISPR technology. Mm. Yeah, edit I, as I, you please. I, I don't tend to think about the human genome at all, other than let's go and demonstrate that we can synthesize a human scale genome. Like that's uh, apart from my babies. But there is like eradicating but, disease. That, well, yeah. Like if well, you know there's so, going to be a disease. Then so we talked about this earlier. Yeah. But but the you know kind of the the you know, the push to go and read the human genome, which was really controversial when it was first proposed in the 1980s. The, the big reward 
that was promised out of that is we're going to better understand human life in, in health and disease because we'll have the code. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's great. Uh, when you have the ability to synthesize a complete human genome, that reduces down to theoretically you should be able to fix any genetic disease. That's pretty cool. I'm, and, and let's just leave it at that. I don't want to talk about enhancement. Do I don't want to let's talk do about it. engineering us for space. Yeah. But, but that is the big promise of having synthesis technologies. Something's broken, you want to fix it, we got the tools. Yeah, yeah, and augmentations are also very interesting, but we'll yeah. hold off on, on that for now. Because will augmentations be available for only the ultra rich? We'll see about that. No, biology's cheap. Like, you run on Doritos, you know, probably. <laughs> you, you know, like, like people, like, biology is cheap. I, I, when, when you get this, uh, the, these ideas that it'll only be for the rich, that's just, that's human economic distortions. It has nothing to do with biology. Well, biology, how, how about this? Rather than yeah. it, it, it not, 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 not to straw man that point, because mm -hmm. straw manning it is just to say like, oh, it'll only be available for the rich, because that's just the straw man, because yes, over time, exponentials decrease the pricing of costs, and therefore, uh, it sure. even becomes available to middle class. And, and biology poor, is the ultimate exponential technology. It's the yeah. ultimate. Yeah, it's definitely a huge, like, like, huge what's the most powerful computer on Earth? This is super it's between your ears. The human, well, I was going to say. It's between your ears. Yeah, and, and how much does it cost to now, make a brain? For now, maybe even not anymore. Yeah, we'll see. But, 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 but we're, yeah. still, we're still forgetting one of the major principles of the conversational point, <laughs> which, which is, which is I, I, do, I, do, I do firmly think we are severely underprepared for genetic enhancements because we do not understand how much a genetic advancement for somebody that can initially afford it will end up accelerating their offspring much more quickly than the poor and middle class would be able to afford it. I think that might be the case, and it might not be, and I might be wrong. Look, if you, yeah. if you just look at the numbers, mm, the wealthy are being outcompeted uh, in, in terms of just more population. And, and, and yet the tools that we have being wealthy are becoming available for everyone so fast. So, uh, you know, I don't know where it goes, but all I know is this is a remarkable time to be alive. I, thanks for saying remarkable that. Remarkable time to be alive. I agree. And, and I think this planet uh, you know, can support far more people than we have today if we just manage resources better. And it's a big universe. You know? like, I try and remember, yeah. we're just one tiny little piece of rock. So, yes. so I, the whole idea of the population bomb and uh, you know, I was discounted long ago. Now people worry about falling populations. I think it just comes down to resource management. And, and you know, there's no reason why we can't do things a lot better. Particularly because these technologies, these biotechnologies, allow us to really make sustainable resources. Uh, yeah. You know, we can't yeah, keep true. paving over the world and putting up, you know, new factories to make cell phones. That, that obviously doesn't go on forever, but life is a pretty universal technology and it works yeah. with, you know, elemental building blocks. So we're we don't know the limits. We're excited to grow meat, we're excited to grow dairy, grow eggs, all in bioreactors, we are excited to uh, eradicate disease. And you've these covered a lot of these things. topics. These are amazing. S store digital data yeah. in DNA rather than these massive sure. uh, non-economic and non-sustainable server farms. There's, um, there's so many amazing applications of it, but also we are, we are just, we, we are, we are, we are, we are morally infants. Sure. We are moral infants. I'm very optimistic like you are. It's an amazing time to be alive, but we are a bunch of infants that are being given the tools of God and we have, and we're, we don't we barely even have a teenager that's holding our hand right now and helping guide us. No, we don't even no, not, we're, we're learning by doing. But but thankfully we're pretty fast learners. Hopefully organizations like the Center this of is, this is, Engineering Biology will, will I, I be really like, believe yeah. that this is the most important project I will ever be involved in. Like, like this, this, when I was talking with George a month ago, I just said, I, the fact that we are in the same room 
um, you know, and part of this same project is, is incredible. And we welcome all participants to this. And this is, like you said, step one, where is the this Center is, of Excellence for Engineering Biology, the, the, the same sort of group of, of, of four leaders from China and from Russia and from the Middle there's, East. There's we, labs we, popping up all over the we world. Need, we yeah. need the there's collaboration across the world. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's labs popping up all over the world. This is just the common thread that connects yes. them. GP Wright is, is it's young, it's bottom up rather than top down, but it is just an amazing organization. And now it's really starting to get its footing and you'll see more and more of this moving forward. Yeah, so GP Wright's gonna be more about the ethics standards and the core technologies. Oh, and core technologies, then, papers, filling in the gaps, doing the research. Yeah. It's built around a series of pilot projects that uh, are, are stepping stones to, to engineering full genomes. Can you genomes. just give us a quick um, yeah, the first, the first main project that, that was announced uh, earlier this year is, uh, is essentially recoding human cells uh, so that they are completely resistant to viral infections. Um, and this is building on technology that's already been developed. It means making about a 1% change across the human genome to essentially remove certain uh, triplet codons from the cells, but when you do that, the uh, viruses are simply not able to infect those cells. This is important wow. from a research perspective, it's important from a manufacturing perspective, because a lot of cells are used in manufacturing of, of other proteins and biotech products. If a, if a virus gets into those reactors, they can completely contaminate and shut down the, uh, the production of an important medicine. Yeah. So that's, okay. that's one of the pilot projects. Uh, for the production of, of, of certain medicine, but yeah. not. But is this also for humans to become? No, no, no. Right no, now, no. right now, you have to understand. Nothing okay. we do in the genome project, right, is about engineering humans. So, so for it's about engineering human in, cells and being able to develop the technologies to work at human scales. And even then, the the reason why we're working with human cells rather than a mouse or a monkey or anything like this, it's because human, working with the human, brings in humanity. Yeah. So people go, oh, this is about human? Not bacteria or mouse, mouse. or some yeah, other yeah. organism they yeah. can't pronounce? That wakes that them up. That's, what, that's why the yeah. Human Genome Project was successful yeah. in waking up and bringing in humanity to the idea that, of genomics. It wasn't sequencing a horse. So with, uh, with GP Wright, like this first example you just described, we're, we're, we're making medicine inside of a bioreactor and we need well, to make well, it. Well, we're, we're making a, a cell that is, is virus resistant. It yes. becomes an, uh, a, a super cell safe cell, a super virus, cell. Yeah. A super cell, yeah, that yeah. is virus resistant because if a virus was to find its way into that bioreactor, it, it would the, infect the, everything. Yeah. It, it simply can't replicate in the cell. And that super cell then enters into production systems which for, could be a human well no 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 it, it, this is really looking at bioreactors so so where would those supercells go though yeah into the bioreactors they become the manufacturing plant okay so we just got oh yeah we got we got yeah time. we haven't even gotten started yeah, I, know. <laughs> I know this is this is this is this is the thing about biology there's so much <laughs> There's so much you know, throat clearing and background you kind of have to do because most people just have no understanding of the stuff that makes us. That's me. Yeah. That's like me. A, we know more, I, I, I joke that we know more about our cell phones than our cells. You know, so, so it's... That's, that's a pretty good one. Yeah, well, yeah. You know, what can I say? And this is, you know, here's me you know, with my favorite pet virus. It's just like, this is, um, this is how I, this is the work that I'm doing these days because I, I make designer genomes. That's my. That's what I want to do. It's just all I want to do. I want to go and engineer genomes. But we don't have the ability to go and engineer genomes left and right. Um, there's only been one bacterial, one group that has made a synthetic bacterial genome. There's lots of people that modify bacterial genomes. There's a lot of metabolic engineering happening. I just want to sit down and write them from scratch. Mm -hmm. So I had to go back to the smallest, simplest genomes, which are viruses. And, and you know, I think, click through. There's, mm -hmm. there's some interesting stuff here. But That you know, was from your TED Talk? This was, actually, that was from a talk that I gave um, to Jeff Bezos and friends earlier this year. Oh, that was from, um, okay, cool. For but a, same at a conference called Mars. At, okay, cool. I but I bring my little pet virus around a lot. David Eagleman was there too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was a really great We're conference. We're hosting him on Friday. And, Actually, and, something and the point else that, that I try and make yeah, is yeah. that these things, 
you know, viruses are, are basically just USB sticks. They're, they're, they, they contain, if you could look inside of this, mm-hmm. there would be genetic code. And, and about a photo? No, 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 way more than a photo file size. We're talking, again, like a movie size? Uh, or no, more? smaller. Um, uh, most viral genomes uh, uh, are quite small. Um, uh, I think the biggest viral genome was about 2 million base pairs, so about half the size of, of an E. coli bacterium. But, but oh, typically, wow. they're much smaller. The, Damn. This one is That's small. Yeah. This one is, is, is like 6,000 bits of code. Um, That's very small. quite small. Holy yeah. cow! And and uh, how many expressions do you get from six thousand? Well, you, it, it it has you know fifteen or sixteen proteins. Fifteen or sixteen. Yeah, like when you small. when you look at this, this is kind of a molecular jigsaw puzzle that puts that builds a container that then gets filled up with with viral DNA. You you made this so clear when we were talking prior to this is people have this negative connotation with the word virus. Yeah. And it's time to strip that bias away. Oh yeah. Away. Yeah, it's just time to move beyond it. Like if you look at it as a USB stick, like some people, you know, a USB stick can have a, a nefarious program on it, you know, mm-hmm. it can have a computer virus. But most of it is just moving code around. So we've learned how to yeah. domesticate viruses and make them do useful things. And, and even though, yes, there's viral infections that pop up around the world, whether new ones, Ebola, Zika, et cetera, um, you know, for the most part, viruses today save more lives than they hurt because we use viruses as vaccines. We use them for gene therapies. We're using them in state-of-the-art cancer therapies now. So virus engineering in general is just, I, I, I'm, I'm a fan because being able to make these, I think we're going to create an app store for being able to do repairs, do therapeutics, do diagnostics, not just in humans, but in basically every organism on the planet. Wow. I, I remember when you were telling me about the synthetic virus app store, I was thinking to myself, damn, that's a pretty relatable way to to explain things. So, so then you take these, uh, these, this digital biology that you've written, and then you have that uh, enter into, uh, into, you make that into a, a DNA. Into yeah, we can design a viral genome from scratch. They're relatively small. We've got computer software that can easily handle the design process. And when we finish tinkering with the design, remember, we get atomic control yes. over, over that design. We can hit print and send the file to a DNA synthesizer and write out the entire viral genome. And then that... Take that viral genome that you've just printed out, just a piece of DNA, put that into a cell. Via? There's various ways of doing it. They don't really matter. It Um, it can be CRISPR, it can be... No, no, no. CRISPR is is another technology. To get DNA into into a cell... The nucleus or... No, well, if it's a bacterium, you just have to get it into inside... Yeah, just okay. getting it into a cell depends on the cell. With okay. a bacterium, yeah. it's so easy. All you have to do is heat it up. And it'll accept the DNA? Yeah. If you, if, remember, bacteria work at, E. coli work at body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. If you have a fever at 42 degrees Celsius, the bacterium goes nuts. So it, it's literally dying from, from heat exposure. So it starts to accept DNA from its environments, essentially saying, help, you got any code out there that will allow me to survive? Is that why the body temperature increases? Yeah, to, fever to will kill. kill off bacteria. It slows the growth and kills them. I know, uh-huh. blow your mind. <laughs> but you know, the reality is if you heat a bacterium up to 42 degrees, it'll pick up free DNA from its environment. So that's how you can get DNA into a bacterium. A little bit harder with a human cell or a yes, plant cell, but which you would need one of these technologies for. But the that's why CRISPR you, or a virus or no, to, you just you do it in the lab. You make virus. Well, that's why you use a virus. Yeah, a okay. CRISPR a CRISPR construct still needs to get delivered into a cell. Okay. CRISPR is an editing technology. Yes. I know, I know it's a really Mainstream sounds media. really cool. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah, yeah most yeah. people we're still. It's okay. not common knowledge so, yet. So now, anyway. okay, so now you are synthesizing viruses, yeah. engineering, and then it is about 6,000 or so uh, d- of these characters. Of, of yeah. yeah, so we, yeah, so I started doing this work. I was inspired, let's click through, I, you know, like viruses comes in all shapes and sizes because there is no standard USB port in biology. That's why you get the diversity uh, uh, in the viral space. And most of the viruses that we hear about are the ones that cause illness. So 
uh, but that's there there are billions of viruses this is crazy most HIV, of them are harmless. influenza ebola smallpox all look different they all look different they all have shapes yeah all you, shapes. you can't see them with a light microscope you need an electron microscope these are really really tiny but they're basically just usb sticks yeah so yeah, for, for so we've been reprogramming them learning how to make them in the therapeutics great that's wonderful we're just getting started because now that we have synthetic biology we can take it a lot further so there we go you know, so so now we can become, they become therapeutics we can make than, them really there like we can yeah. design them to do just about anything some people worry about making them into bioweapons that's actually pretty easy to stop you just you you interfere at, at the point of the synthesizer you can oh, even it's, in, it's so easy to you can stop. even interfere at the point of uh, of the design tool but you know, really, if you want yeah. to look at who's yeah. making the stuff we have to worry about, Mother Nature. Mm. She's constantly mixing, you know, countless viruses combinations together in the world every day. And people with malevolent intentions, but yes. Yeah. So therapeutics. So, mm -hmm. so this guy, most people have, don't know him. His name is Eckert Wimmer, but he made the first synthetic virus 16 years ago. So none of this is new. Like, uh, I, I wish it was. 16 years is pretty new, but yeah. Well, no, 16 years is forever. How long have we had the iPhone? Yeah, 10. Yeah, yeah. So, so, and we're on generation 10. 10, right. Yeah. Yeah, so, no, this is, uh, how, many, how many synthetic viruses do you think have been made? Maybe a couple thousand now? 25. Wow. Wow, so this is huge. You're, you're really in uncharted territory now. Yeah, well, yeah. this is just it. So, I love it. So there's been kind of a blind spot in the synthetic biology community around synthetic viruses because, well, most scientists are paid with public money. Most public resources are not keen to work with viruses and make designer viruses. Um, but that's why I think we're going to see a whole new biotech industry kind of emerge around this stuff because it's, they're so powerful, they're so small, the technology for designing and building them is getting so pervasive. Yeah. And yeah, we should probably think a lot more about biosecurity. Biosecurity. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, yeah. Yeah. But also how to, biosecurity can also be how do we shut down the next epidemic? Yeah. Correct. Right. Exactly. That's a good way to put it. Yep. Anyway, and that's the paper. It was... July 2002, so it's been, you know, again, good 16 years. Unfortunately, the first virus that was created was polio virus, not a great ambassador for the field. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then what virus would be? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But now you're on to d yeah. designing them with the intent to yeah, cure so, cancer. So, as so, so this is the standard process for doing a synthetic virus. You basically start with a virus design on computer. There's no biology required to start. You start with a laptop, mm -hmm. you design the genetic code, you go and synthesize it using various groups and today that you can contact these online and then you load it into a cell to become the manufacturing plant for the virus. So mm -hmm. the process is actually fairly straightforward. There's different tweaks depending on different viruses but the overall process is really fairly straightforward. This is crazy. And, and you can do it in the turnaround time is under a week. So it, it's not expensive. Under a week? Yeah. Damn, that's Under so Under a week today, now. depending on the virus. Holy cow. So this is work that I did with Autodesk. If you go to the next slide. You just load DNA yeah. that you write on your computer into a cell. Yeah. And Damn. then the next slide, I started doing this with Autodesk, which was a design group, a design software group. And this was the first synthetic virus we made uh, with them. And it's, it's actually this virus, PhiX174. Um, now, I, I wasn't the original synthesizer of the Phi X174 virus. I just followed in the footsteps of the scientists that did it just to prove I could do it, essentially mail order. <laughs> and, and I did, um, which was kind of fun. It wasn't expensive, the turnaround time was pretty quick. And then we thought, okay, well, we've, we've made a synthetic virus. Now, where do we want to go explore? And I've always wanted to make cancer fighting viruses. So I found this guy, I was introduced to him by an anonymous emailer that said, hey, have you heard about his work? This, this Dr. Bruce Smith ran one of the first clinical trials for cancer fighting viruses in, in a type of, uh, for a type of bone cancer in dogs. So I called up, I called up Dr. Smith and I said, hey, uh, how would you like to make designer viruses for your dogs? 
And, and he said, that sounds wild. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but we've become really close in the years subsequent. And we were successful. We made the first completely synthetic cancer-fighting virus uh, suitable for dogs, and now we're continuing that work with the company that I founded last year, Humane Genomics. Um, so we're now we're, we're just iterating. It's always design, build, test, design, build, test, like any type of other engineering process. And with Humane, you have this um, automated development personalized therapies, and then here you show us kind of exactly... Quick walkthrough. You always walk start with yeah. one animal, one patient, so to speak. You, you study their particular cancer cells. You go and, and take the information from their cancer cell and you go and actually use that for the design process. You make the synthetic virus, you test it in the lab on their particular cancer, and then you go back and, and treat the animal. So this whole process is essentially fully personalized therapeutics. Yeah. And, and that's what I've been championing because it's incredibly fast, it's incredibly cheap, it's always state of the art. And I think it's the biggest revolution in drug development that I've seen in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so, you, so we take a biopsy from an uh, animal that already has uh, cancerous cells, and then you're... So then you you're, study uh, that particular cancer, because no two cancers are the same. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You use the data from that cancer to drive the design process to make a virus specific for that cancer. And then when you give it, when you put the two together, it's like giving the cancer cells the flu. Yes. Normal cells are unaffected. Affected. Cancer cells get the flu, they die they off die pretty off. fast. Wow, super targeted. But you do have to take a biopsy. That's yeah, one, you that's always one have to start with the cancer you want to kill. Trying yeah. to, we've, we've got- Because you have to understand it more than just, it's, yeah. yeah, yeah. We've yeah. got a lot of data that shows that making one size fits all cancer medicines just really isn't, isn't working. Work. Now, now that's is that is that true that it's, it's like cancer is like snowflakes? Every cancer. Every cancer is different. Wow. Even it's like, like an infection in your body with your own cells. With your own cells, yeah. So then, of course, it's going to be different then. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, so you know, I like to say that when it comes to personalized medicine, it's dogs Ooh, that are going to lead the way in pretty much all of it. Yes. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, yeah cute dog. Uh, but yeah, dogs are really starting to lead the way. You're, we're seeing more and more dog studies, and these aren't research dogs. These are companion dogs. These are dogs that you know are part of our households and our families, and we're highly invested in giving them great, you know, great care. Um, you yeah. Know, so I think uh, certainly with, we're seeing it in cancer, but I think we'll see it in a lot more treatments. Yeah. Yeah, and this. This Stuart is a Brand quote, quote that I just think is so important these days. Stuart Brand. Yeah. Uh, you know, prescient. Uh, just, we are as we gods. We are as gods. We might as well get good yeah, at it. Yeah. And, and, yeah, these technologies are pretty powerful. Um, yeah. And, and they're, they're advancing really rapidly. So. I think my, my first quick question on the way out is that um, what would you say would be the map the roadmap for humans, besides, you know, you guys have the, the genome project on the, on the right side of things, on the writing side yeah. of things, what would you say is a good way for us to figure out how to pair ethics and morality within um, the engineering and the designing of being the, the gods? Well, I, I think it's kind of a natural progression. Um, look, right now we're seeing, um, it, just take IVF for example. You know, we've just crossed the 40-year threshold. There was that was controversial in the day, but now we now we have something like six or seven million IVF babies. You know, helping, and that means we've helped a lot of people that couldn't otherwise get pregnant get pregnant. That's pretty cool. That's a great use of technology. It's not controversial today. Um, I think in, we start seeing CRISPR technologies, which are genome editing technologies. Potentially, we could use them for augmentation. We're not ready. We don't know how to augment humanity. But now it becomes a tool for doing genetic surgery. And if there is a chromosomal abnormality, now we've got a new tool to go and fix it. I think we'll see that come into human society relatively quickly because, of course, we're going to use every technology available to help, you know, a, a baby live a happy, healthy life. Um, I think when it, I think kind of the next step after that is people um, using some of these technologies for, for self 
exploration, self-experimentation, because you have dominion over your body. And if you want to add a tail or glow in the dark or change your eye color or whatever, frankly, uh, I think it's no one's business but your own. And these tools are going to eventually become accessible enough and safe enough and robust enough to be able to allow that type of experimentation. And from that experimentation, we might actually get some clues as to what's safe for, for larger populations. Uh, I think it's just an incremental stepwise process. And, and if you kind of pull back and look at this in, in a longer time frame, um, this is a really powerful tool for, for evolution. Not just of, uh, you know, we've been evolving, not so much physically anymore as socially. Um, I, I think that now we start to be able to take that intention and take our, our idea of society and culture and, and actually start to apply it to our physical form. This, as we, as we repair the environments on this planet, um, these tools will be important. As we start to think about how do we go to other places, whether it's the moon or Mars or just orbit, um, uh, you know, being in a, in a, in a uh, without gravity, now we have some tools potentially to, to allow us to thrive. I don't know how it all plays out. I don't. Uh, I wish I could be around. Breakdown. That was yeah. a pretty good breakdown, Andrew. And, uh, but, and it's, um, I think we, we, we will we'll be having more of these conversations moving forward uh, at larger scales, hopefully in larger theaters with larger online audiences, um, and eventually in, in sports stadiums where we can literally have 50,000 people all figuring out the future of the ethics and moralities and all and the complications of design in and engineering general, around these subjects. In general, we, we become better to each other over time. Like, uh, you've got Steven Pinker's book yeah, over there course, on your bookshelf. Nature, yeah. So, yeah. So but we are approaching an age that we've never approached before, uh -huh. and there's a bunch of different existential risks that are approaching, and there's a lot of geopolitical tension that still exists. Yep. We are not that far away from the previous times we've had geopolitical tension. There's still just some that's going on on the earth right now. Um, but you're, you're generally right. Let's see what happens, um, and let's have more conversations about making sure that what happens is prosperity. Um, Andrew, do you think we're alone in the cosmos? No. No. I, I've, I've never... Uh, it's a pretty big place. <laughs> and uh, uh, let's just say that we're, there's still so much to learn. And do you think we're in a simulation? Uh, yeah, of course, because you, you're, everything you think you know is in a piece of meat inside a bone box. Yeah. So you live in a simulation. That was the I first can. time anybody answered that question. Matter of fact. Yeah, matter of fact. Yeah. So okay, so because we are, because uh, because our perception is trapped inside of this meat. Well, and our perception and is so limited on limited, every scale, correct? And yeah. and the data that's coming in is being modeled in a piece of meat. Yeah. Yeah, you live in a simulation. You don't live in reality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's take him out to lunch. Yeah. Let's hang out with them. Yeah. Uh, I love it. So, um, so the sensory inputs are limited. Um, we see so little of not only electromagnetic, but we see so little of, of we're just trapped in a three-dimensional. Um, we tell all sorts of stories to ourselves to kind of process this information. Most of those stories are crazy. Um, you know, call it self-delusion. So, the, so, there, so therefore, <laughs> therefore, who is the simulator would be a follow-up. Mind your business. <laughs> what do you think? I love Ron. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? Do you have any idea? Uh, no, I, I think that that's a, just another vast place to explore. Cool. Um, we, have not, um, we haven't really started changing and, and playing with our meat processor very much yes. yet. Yes. Um, but that's just a, a, another sandbox as big as synthetic biology. Awesome. I love it. And then how about, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Uh, my kids. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the answer I give today. Um, but, you know, uh, a few years ago I would have said just cells. Yeah. 
but you know, I've got a, I've got a picture on my laptop of my kid just when kids when they're just a few cells big. So yeah, yeah, it's so interesting. Yeah, that would be a good one to add to a future conversation. <laughs> this is these are my children outside. Look, I, I don't care about most physical things. Most of it ends up in landfill. Yeah, I care about living things. Um, and living things are just some of the most incredible and beautiful th things I can imagine. Agreed. Um, it, I, you know, they all start as cells. It doesn't matter, plant, animal, bacteria. Um, so they're pretty cool. Uh, I, the virus is a, is a little different because it's not actually alive. Uh, it's been described by Eckert Rimmer, the, the, who made the first synthetic virus as a, as a chemical with a life cycle. I like that. Um, I like that terminology. But yeah. uh, that's kind of the, the beauty that I see in a virus besides its shape is, is that it is, um, it, it's essentially such tight genomic code yes. that it is biological poetry. It is biological poetry. That's such a good way to put it as well. Actually, you've been spewing a lot of biological poetry at us today um, we've been learning about you have you have it's been it's been such a pleasure learning about biology in some of its most relatable um, forms thank you thank you for thank coming you. onto the show Andrew thanks for teaching us about all of this we know My pleasure we know so little about biology but you know you know more and it's great to have you on the show teaching us about it um, genome engineering um, especially synthetic virus engineering where we're going with our future with that um, and the also biosecurity bioethics check out the G, gp right gp right project and this is, and yeah. you know particularly if you're young the, this is a field being built by young scientists. Exactly. And th this is a, one of the main things that we talk about on the show is not only don't just consume this content, go create with it, make videos, make blog posts, go create companies with it, but also educate our youth about it. Our youth are entering into the age of AI and automation, and it's so important now to be at the edge, at the forefront. So teaching kids to get involved in things mm -hmm. like the GP right. Genome Project Right, that is a really great way to be at the edge, be at the forefront. So get them involved, keep disseminating this information, go and share it with two other people. Subscribe, comment below, let us know your thoughts, join the community, join the family. We need your support on Patreon to help scaling this content, impacting more people. We accept cryptocurrency as well. That link's in the bio. Join us, fam. Let's get to sports stadiums. Let's, let's get more people excited about this stuff. Let's support epic people like Andrew as well. Thank you, Ron, for producing and directing. Much love, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Peace.